Welcome to SelfDiscoveryWisdom.com, formerly known as Self Discovery Media. On these podcasts, you're going to hear people who speak from the heart. They've taken the journey in life. Many things have happened to them, but they've changed it to happening for them. And in their strength, their courage, they've discovered their abilities and their wisdom, and they are now sharing it here with you. Do enjoy each show. We bring it to you with love and knowing that it's going to help you on your journey of life. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Your Health is Your Choice right here at selfdiscoverywisdom.com. Um, we are, um, I am Sarah Traymer, your host, and my guest today is Dr. Paula Gordon, and we're going to be talking about some very, very big, sensitive, and something you should be aware of, dense breasts. I'd never heard about them until I heard her speak um, on a program, and it was, what? What are you talking about? Uh, we're aware that we need to pay attention to breast cancer. We're aware that uh, many people have breast cancer. It might be one of the leading uh, cancers out there, but dense breasts I've never heard of. Uh, Dr. Paula Gordon is a clinical professor in the Department of Radiology at the University of British Columbia. She's passionate, clinical researcher and educator. And in the 1980s, her research on ultrasound guided breast biopsies enabled accurate diagnosis of breast masses. We're going to be learning all about that today, folks. And it allowed women to forego surgery of non-cancerous abnormalities. Her research in 1995 was the first show that ultrasound could find cancers missed in mammograms. And this has led to a, a paradigm change in the management of screaming women with dense breasts. And that began, <clears throat> excuse me, in the US in 2009. And it's now spreading across Canada, UK, Asia, um, um, Australia and Europe. Now, there's a lot that we don't know about um, as as just as ordinary people about cancer. We hear about it all all the time. Um, you know, go and get a mammogram, go and get checked. Uh, but you know, we talked about this before the show that there are so many places that you know you're you're 40. You may have history of breast cancer or cancers in the in the body, you know, in the family. And uh, but your doctor say no, you're not old enough. You've got to come back when you're 50. And this show is called Your Health Is Your Choice because we want to empower you to make the right choices. And later on in the show, we're going to talk about some of those obstacles that you're going to find in in the dealing with doctors that kind of aren't paying attention to what you are needing and we're going to tell you how you can overcome that we're going to be looking at some slides today if you are listening to this i invite you to go back to the show page selfdiscoverywisdom.com and to sip in, simply put in dr paula gordon and the slides and the pdf will be there so you can follow what we're saying and uh, we're going to be looking at exactly what dense breasts are and what this means to you and how do you find out if you have them and what can you do about it this is an educational program, folks, that hopefully will save some lives because you are empowered with the right information on what to do. Welcome to the show, Dr. Paula. Thank you for having me. Now, I didn't know what dense breasts are. I mean, I know what heavy ones are because I've got them. But I know <laughs> dense breasts, when you were talking about it, what do you mean by that? Let's start there. What do you mean by dense breasts? I will show some pictures later. Okay. But what breast density refers to is the proportion of normal breast tissue to fat. All mm -hmm. women in their breasts have some fat, some glandular tissue where the milk is made, some fibrous tissue and so on. And on a mammogram, fat looks black or dark gray and normal breast tissue looks white. Now, unlike other parts of the body where let's say most people's spleen looks about the same from one person to the next, breasts can vary tremendously in what they look like from one person to the to another, yet all be normal. So at the extreme ends, you've got some women who have mostly fat or almost all fat and hardly any normal breast tissue showing. And at the other end, you've got women who've got loads and loads of normal breast tissue with almost no fat. And the reason that's relevant is that although fat is dark gray or black, all lumps, be they cancers, or non-cancerous lumps like cysts and other non-cancerous tumors are white. So if a woman's normal breast is completely black, any small lump that's white is gonna jump out at us like a star in the, mm -hmm. in the dark sky. Mm -hmm. If a woman's normal breast is completely white, she can have even a rather large cancer that won't show because we say it's like looking for a snowball in a snowstorm. Right. So it's, that's the main risk of having dense breasts is that 
mammograms are less accurate. Now we still see cancers in dense breasts, but depending on where the cancer is and how much normal dense tissue is around it, um, they can be masked or camouflaged if you like. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest risk. The other, the double whammy, I call it, is that women who have dense breasts are at a higher risk to get breast cancer mm. than women who have fatty breasts. Now, we divide breast density, and this is fairly uniform across the world, um, into four categories, uh, A, B, C, and D. So A is the completely fatty, B is a little bit of dense tissue, C is a lot more dense, and D is pretty much no fat. Mm -hmm. And categories C and D are considered dense, and categories A and B are non-dense. Now, depending where a woman's uh, what woman lives and where she has her screening mammogram, the information she's given can vary tremendously. There are some countries that don't even record the breast density. Mm. In Canada, which where we are, um, there are now seven, as of this week, <laughs> seven provinces telling women what their category is, A, B, C, or D. And there's three more on board for 2023. Good. Still a couple of holdouts, because as you know, in addition to the 10 provinces, we have three territories. Mm -hmm. um, but the US got started far before Canada did. Um, I, I'll tell you the story of, of the woman who got the advocacy moving going in the US because she's basically inspired everyone else uh, since. Her name was Dr. Nancy Capello. She was a PhD in educational leadership. And in 2004, after years of faithfully going for her annual mammogram, because that's the standard there, and we can talk about that later too, um, within about six weeks of a normal mammogram, she found a lump in her breast. Long story short, she was diagnosed with a stage 3C breast cancer, wow. already spread to 13 lymph nodes in her armpit. And she had the whole works, the surgery, the radiation, the chemotherapy. Um, and uh, she unfortunately has died, not of breast cancer. No. She died from a rare complication, a uh, late complication of chemo. I've heard of that before. Yes. So, so. We really want women's cancers to be found as early as possible for several reasons. Number one, it reduces the risk of dying of breast cancer. Right. But what, uh, what people don't always think of is that when a cancer is found earlier, a woman can have effective treatment with less aggressive therapy. Mm -hmm. When cancer is found big, women usually need a mastectomy. They usually need uh, a procedure to stage the armpit lymph nodes called an axillary dissection. Uh, and that has a significant rate of complication of something called lymphedema, where women get permanent swelling of the hand and arm. You may have seen some women wearing a sleeve, yes. a compression sleeve on that side. Uh, they're usually flesh colored. Nowadays, they make them multicolored, so look like a, <laughs> a full arm tattoo. But that swelling is life changing for many women. Um, and women with uh, bigger cancers, of course, need chemotherapy. Nowadays, if we find cancer early, women can have a lumpectomy instead yeah. of mastectomy. Women can avoid the big armpit surgery and have a, a different kind of node staging procedure that has a much lower risk of lymphedema. And finally, if women meet all the right criteria, they can even avoid chemo. So finding cancers early is important, not just to save lives. Mm -hmm. it, all those advantages increase the quality of life yes. for women with cancer. And so knowing a woman, a woman has dense breasts will help her choose to be screened more aggressively, perhaps with one of the other modalities that we can talk about uh, and help find her cancer early. Stitch in time, right? You know, stitch in time saves nine. That saying is there for a reason, is that when we can, you know, when we're aware of something happening, we can prevent it from getting worse. That goes with anything in life, right? That awareness. Uh, I know here in BC, we have a million people without a doctor. I'm one of them. It's extremely hard to oh, even see hard. a doctor right now, never mind get referred, you know, to having tests or anything. I myself went back 2018, I went through the um, is it the, not the ultrasound or the sonic of the breasts? I didn't do the mammogram. I did the other where they, is it an ultrasound of the breast? Well, it sounds like you had ultrasound, but um, women who have not had a recent mammogram 
are usually not sent for screening ultrasound. They shouldn't be. In fact, their, their screening ultrasound, if they had, would not be covered by our provincial health insurance unless they know they're a category C or D and they've got a requisition from their doctor. The problem, which is huge for women with no family doctor, is to have a screening mammogram in British Columbia, you have to give the name of a family doctor yeah. or nurse practitioner, or I think even a naturopath uh, who will get a copy of the report. And actually, uh, that's one of the major only flaws in BC uh, because we're the only province that makes that requirement. Right. That need a family doctor. And so if you don't have a family doctor, you're going to have to go to a walk-in clinic uh, to just so a doctor will agree that you can use their name so that you can have a screening mammogram. Otherwise, you're hooped. Yeah, and quite honestly, trying to get into those walk-in clinics today are virtually impossible. So what do you end up doing? You end up doing virtual doctors and you're allowed one question hey. and three minutes. <laughs> as, as long as you get their name yeah. to a requisition, right. not the requisition, sorry, so that you can self-refer. Right, exactly. Um, how does one know you have dense breasts? Does it only Thank from a, a mammogram? <laughs> Thank you for asking. Only from a mammogram. You cannot tell by look or feel. A doctor can't tell. If your doctor does a breast exam, you can't tell because breast tissue can feel a number of ways. It can feel sort of soft and uniform. It can feel lumpy like a bag of marbles. It can feel firm like, like solid concrete with no texture. And all of those can be normal. Not only can they be normal, they can be fatty or dense. Mm. So the only way you can tell is on a mammogram. It's a judgment call that the radiologist makes eyeballing the pictures and want to show up my picture shortly. Uh, you'll, you'll understand why. And nowadays there's also software that some programs are using and the software uh, determines the density. How does the software do that? I'm intrigued. Well, it's, it's, it's uh, digital technology. It's measuring how much X-ray gets through. Well, that's of course what determines whether it's black or white and it's making these objective measurements. Whereas when a radiologist looks at the picture, it's subjective. Right. Ah, so it's more pinpointing the problem by refining. Um, uh, no, it's qua it's quantifying the, okay. the rather than qualifying. I won't say pinpoint. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, nobody likes a mammogram. They're so goddamn painful. Uh, I have very big breasts. So they really, really are painful. Um, am I doing it wrong? <laughs> um, maybe. Uh, they shouldn't be excruciating. They should be uncomfortable. We need to compress the breast tissue for two reasons. Number one is to spread out the tissue so that we can see cancers better. But by making the breast thinner when we compress it, we need less radiation to go through to make right. a good picture. So it really should be, uh, and believe me, for, uh, for me, with small breasts, it's even more uncomfortable because when they compress me, they're mostly compressing my pectoral muscle. Mm -hmm. And um, it's only for a few seconds and it can, you know, can save your life. Mm -hmm. uh, the old machines, I'm talking more than a decade ago, maybe more than that, <laughs> the, the technologist would put on the compression and she'd run behind the panel, yes. and press the button to take the picture, and then she'd have to come back out and release the compression manually. Right. All modern mammogram machines now release the compression automatically the minute the exposure is made. The other mm -hmm. thing is women <laughs> should know Women should know as the technologist, first of all, when, when you're being positioned and you've got to do exactly what you're told, because if you're tensing up and you're trying to help yeah. the, you actually don't get as good, as good a picture. You sometimes don't even include as much breast tissue as we should, but she'll do that with a foot pedal and she'll be holding your breast in place while she uses the foot pedal to lower the compression. When she gets to a certain point, she's going to let go and she's going to manually tighten. And she's testing from the side how taut the breast feels. Now, you're allowed to say perfectly, you're perfectly allowed to say, please stop. That's all I can tolerate. Right. And women need to know <laughs> the difference in quality between, okay, that's as much as I can tolerate. And just letting the technologist yes. make the decision. The difference in quality is negligible. So, right. so definitely don't let it get excruciating. And especially if you've had a bad experience in the past, you can tell the tech, yeah. look, even though I really had a terrible one last time, I've come back, but I want you to stop when I say stop. Now, interestingly, they have done experiment, well, research 
some of the equipment companies came out with a device where the patient could control the compression ah. more or less. And you know what they found? That women put more compression on than they would have if they would told the tech to stop. Because we know ourselves, I can take a bit more, I can take a bit more, but when you've got somebody else doing it, you want to stop them before they're doing it, right? Perhaps. I mean, you know, I, I use the analogy sometimes, look at the things we do to ourselves. We pluck our eyebrows. Yes. You know, if you've ever had your eyebrows plucked by somebody else, it always hurts more than when you do yeah. it yourself. So exactly. what I would urge women to do is take as much as they can tolerate, but not to the point where it's going to discourage them from coming back next right. year. Exactly. Year. Yeah. Um, you know, we hear breast cancer in people that are quite young because cancer, you know, seems to doesn't have an age bracket anymore. I mean, I know that it's kind of like 40, you know, a lot of women are getting that done. Would you say to even do it earlier? No. And uh, but I, I'm going to show you some data in the slide shortly. Um, remember that when we talk about screening, we're talking about screening the whole population mm -hmm. and for screening to make sense, to be practical. It has to happen in a population where the incidence of the disease is high enough to justify the whole population. And 40 is the sweet spot. Mm. That's when the incidence of breast cancer ticks up. And that's when the, uh, well, actually the risk of radiation from a mammogram is negligible uh, in women older than age 20 but we don't do it. And we certainly don't do it routinely, but 40 is the sweet spot. So that's when screening programs should start. And um, as I've told you, there's only four programs in Canada that allow women to self-refer starting at age 40. Um, we're working on that. Um, but um, breast cancer can occur almost at any age. It's, it's not uncommon between 30 and 40, but it's not common enough to screen all women in their 30s. Right. It's very, very uncommon below 30, but it happens. Yes. And and those are tragic because no matter how good our screening programs are, there are going to be women at, you know, at mostly at the younger age that are are going to be I don't like to use the word um, acceptable losses, mm. but that's, that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, what age would you say that women should start checking their breasts for lumps? Well, um, I'm so I, I need to uh, preface this by saying that the panel in Canada that makes recommendations regarding breast cancer screening and checking your own breasts is a form of screening, of mm -hmm. course. Um, they don't recommend screening at a uh, breast self-exam at any age. And yeah. I, I firmly disagree with them. The, the reason the task force comes out with the guidelines they do, uh, women have to understand that the panel that's making these guidelines has no breast cancer experts on it. There's no, Hello? Breast, what? No, breast <laughs> sur no breast surgeon, no oncologist, no radiologist, et cetera. Uh, they are um, volunteers mainly family doctors, nurses, statisticians, and so on. But they specifically exclude experts. Even I don't understand that. I mean, surely well, you would want experts leading the panel. Yes, and 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 the panel um, comes under the purview of the Public Health Agency of Canada. We all know about that now because of COVID and mm -hmm. Tam being on TV all the time. The Public Health Agency of Canada for COVID appointed experts to exactly. make infectious disease experts and vaccine rollout experts, but for cancers and so many other health concerns, I'll give you a list of the kinds of things that ta uh, our task force makes guidelines for, not just breast cancer, prostate cancer, um, papillomavirus, that's the virus that causes uh, cervical cancer, um, uh, hepatitis screening, um, postpartum depression uh, screening, uh, developmental delay in children, among many others. For all of those panels, there are no content experts. They claim to consult experts, but we know up until the most recent 2018 guidelines uh, that came out for breast cancer screening, all of the expert input was ignored. And they, what they do is they, they just um, decided up front that the only research that they would consider to look for the benefits of screening were a kind of uh, research study called a randomized controlled trial. 
all of the trials, randomized controlled trials of screening mammography were performed between 1960 and the late 1980s. So there are years ago. All of the data that has come out since then was ignored. And what they did is they said, okay, according to those 40 to 60 year old studies, here are the benefits of screening. They only considered the lives saved, the mortality reduction. They ignored the other benefit I started out telling you about, about better quality of life by less aggressive therapy. They ignored all that. And what they did is they said, okay, now let's look at what we consider the harms of screening. And they used the word harm. I would argue that they should have said risk. Yeah. Um, The biggest risk that they were concerned about was the anxiety a woman experiences if she's recalled for additional exams after a screening test. Well, women are used to that from pap smears yes. and other tests. You know, there are there are these false alarms. They mm-hmm. call them false positives, which is actually pejorative. It makes it sound like we told you you had cancer when you didn't. Mm-hmm. But the anxiety a woman experiences, if she's recalled, she goes for screening, and I'll show you some of these numbers, is very real. But it's transient transient because 93% of women who are recalled are told, it's okay, you don't have cancer. It was just a shadow. It was just a cyst. It was whatever. And women can tolerate transient anxiety. But instead, the task force is saying, well, we want to spare women that anxiety. So let's not even screen them. And the problem is then you're then we lose the opportunity to find those lethal cancers. So that's the number one concern that the task force had. Okay, before you go any further, how yes. many women are in this uh, forum on the task force? How many women are there? Oh, lots. And yet they're still not standing up to saying that's ridiculous. Yes, in fact, so we, un, unfortunately, um, well, fortunately or unfortunately, we have actually a new task force this go round because the members rotate on and off after a period of time. And um, I have already been very busy on Twitter uh, with the one of the co-chairs is a woman who is convinced that the harms of screening outweigh the benefits. Now, you ask a woman, would you be willing to tolerate a false alarm if it meant we might find a cancer that, you know, could be treated early? I, I would say this. You get a false alarm and what you want is on a timely manner that she goes back in for another test done within the week so the anxiety doesn't build up. Not leave it for months and months before you can get back in because then, yes, you are causing a harm. But I've had that. I've had the cervical cancer thing where, you know, the test was a little iffy. We'd like to do it again. No, you're fine. Right. And so that iffy in between time. Yes. You know, what does this mean? And then you get the relief. Oh, it yes. isn't right. So yes, yes I, it's it's a short period of time of what ifs, which acts very often could be reflection on your life, give you food for thought. Right? I would rather have that and then being told I'm okay. Or in some cases, yes, we are confirming you have it, but you've had even had that time in between to go. If I do have it, what am I going to do about it? Well, not I, only that, if you do have it, we found it early because we found it. Yes. We didn't wait for it to get to a lot. But I I will I will um. Put in the uh, additional information, which is during COVID, the wait times to have oh, those additional yes. tests got too long. Yeah. We're finally getting better, but um, that that it didn't happen the the next week, and it's right. still not happening the very next week. But we know that if women are informed ahead of time, mm-hmm. there's been research that shows that if you tell a woman, and by the way, the likelihood of a false alarm is on a woman's very first mammogram because we have priors to compare to. Um, If we see a a lump on her mammogram, uh, the first thing we do is see if it's been there. Well, it's been there for five years. It hasn't grown. That's for sure not a cancer. We don't even call her back. Right. Um, But um, women need to know the the numbers that I just gave you. 93% of women who get called back don't have cancer. And the the small, it's, it's, it's even more than that. Uh, the small number who do, who do, at least we found it early. So yes. I think that the research has shown that if you inform women of that ahead of time, yeah, that there that the the anxiety won't be so bad. Now there's some women that that you know as they they're convinced themselves, okay, I'm one of the few. I'm going to be the one that has cancer. But um, we do the best we can. 
exactly. You know, again, this show is called Your Health is Your Choice. And the reason is the more educated you are. And, you know, uh, I didn't know we had this panel or that this panel is really not listening to the latest technology, not listening to the latest um, uh, information that is gathered around the world. It's not just gathered in one area. Uh, we want the most updated information that there is available, not something that is 40 plus years old, because that's not serving me. And so we want people out there that are going to represent us and that are actually going to be advocates and fight for us, not people who are going to agree mostly with the men who have no idea about what the, what the impact of breast cancer is going to be or that are still living in the dark ages. So this is why I'm spending time with you. Yes. <laughs> uh, this is why I, I do these webinars so women will be educated. We also have to educate physicians because yes. many physicians don't know that this panel is non-expert. Mm. And, yeah. you know, GPs, uh, family doctors, nurse practitioners, they have to be jack of all trades. Exactly. They have to know about all the diseases. They haven't got time to do the deep dive. Yeah. But when I do lecture and show them all the data, and I'll show, I'll, I'll tell you, let me just uh, backtrack for one second. So I told you that the task force only looks at these really old studies. And if you looked at what's the mortality reduction from screening mammography, those old studies on average showed a mortality reduction of 15 to 20%. Now that's still okay. Yeah. Then that they threw in what they called the harms and they said, no, the harms outweigh those benefits. In fact, more recent research it was actually published in 2014. Certainly plenty of time to, for our task force to have looked at it in 2018, but they ignored it. And this was the largest published study of screening mammography done in the world. It was Canadian. They looked at 2.8 million women and found that women who have screening are 40% less likely to die, not 15 to 20 like right. the old studies. Not only that, but when they looked at women 40 to 49, they were 44% less likely to die of breast cancer than women who don't have screening. There's actually some new research out in the last couple of months from uh, my colleagues at the University of Ottawa who worked with Statistics Canada. And this was really interesting because we know which provinces allow women to come in the 40s and which don't. And they compared the stage of diagnosis when a woman's diagnosed with cancer in the provinces that allow screening at 40 and the provinces that don't. Now, the data was not specific to which of those women actually had screening. So if a woman lived in a province that allowed it for a ladder 40, but she, she uh, didn't go for screening, she was still counted. And what it showed that, so these results are actually conservative. They showed that in the provinces that make women wait until 50, well, obviously, women in the 40s who get cancer are diagnosed at a higher stage because they didn't even have yes. the opportunity for screening. But interestingly, even women in the 50s in those provinces were diagnosed at a later stage than in provinces that could screen in 40 because by not screening women in the 40s, you're not finding those earlier cancers that are going to show up when a woman turns 50 and older. So we have not only do we have data that shows that screening has a tremendous impact on the mortality reduction. We are showing the harm of the task force's current guidelines. And yet in their next review, we have no guarantee that they're going to even look at that study that showed how bad their screening guidelines were and why they have to change them. And why, why might that happen? Because the study that showed that is not a randomized trial. It's real data. It's from Canada. It's Statistics Canada. But I don't, that's irresponsible. Yes, it's absolutely. Ir and we have to call it out. You know, we as, as women, as men who love women, this is where we have to call them out and say, we demand that you are up to date with the very latest information, that you are current with your process and your, your proceedings, that we will not tolerate you resting on your laurels or what you believe. We want the updated data on what we need to do so we can prevent. And I think, the, you know, change doesn't come about at the government level. It comes about by the people demanding that change. So if you are listening to this show today, you contact them, but you're going to give some information on that. You contact them and say, I demand that you put up the latest statistics 
that you follow those statistics, that the recommendations that you do are based on that information. And only if we, I say to people, hold your own health accountable. And the way you're holding your health accountable in this area is making sure those that make those decisions on your mammogram are being held accountable as well. And it's only going to come from our pressure. So I have I have two responses. First of all, I'm hearing a call for action. Yes. That is music to my ears because I will tell you that all of the progress that we have made um, is because of patient advocates. Yes. Not because of not because of research and experts. Um, I will I will say that policymakers and screening programs. Do not listen to experts, but politicians listen to voters. Exactly. What has frustrated me and continues to frustrate me, and I hope you're going to maybe start some change here, is that we need more than the women who are doing all the advocating at the moment are the ones who've already had cancer. Yeah. And they don't want other women to go through what they had to go through because their cancers were diagnosed later than necessary. When I've so um, I, I volunteer as a medical advisor to an organization called Dense Breasts Canada, and the uh, co-founders and the executive director listen to me whine all the time. Why isn't why is why are you guys doing all the work? Why aren't the women who haven't had cancer helping? Because they're the ones who are going to benefit, not you. You've already got your cancer, and you're yeah. getting you're getting some surveillance. And their answer is that because women are in denial, they figure it'll never happen to them. But also they don't know the nitty gritties. I mean, that's the reason why we're doing this show. We're breaking down the nitty gritties. I had no idea what dense breast was. I'm six, I'm nearly 69. And I've never known what dense breast mean. Or that, well, the fact well, that it puts you well, more at risk. You know, I never knew that. No doctor's ever told me that. Uh, when you go for your next screening mammogram, when you finally get a doctor to let you yes. use your name, <laughs> Um, as of October 2018, only because of Dense Breast Canada and the women advocates, um, BC became the first province to tell all women their density category, A, B, C, or D. Ah. Now, I told you there's now seven provinces doing it. And that's because advocates in all the mm. provinces, we've got to find advocates in more provinces, in fact, so the rest come on board, um, have pushed and pushed and the screening programs are reluctantly doing it. But I'll tell you that even in British Columbia, when a woman is told her breast density, she gets an information letter about breast density and they downplay the two risks, the risk of a, cam a cancer being camouflaged and the increased risk of having dense breasts. The letter really downplays it. And, and, um, they, and very often they, they kind of write it in a way of like, what are you telling me? You know, they don't speak in layman terms. And it's like, speak to me in a language I understand. If you're coming at me in all this other language, I, I'm going to ignore it because I don't understand it. Um, they've made, I must tell you, to be in, in fairness, they have made a great effort. In fact, they have, there are panels and experts who review these documents to make sure they try to keep it, and it's hard, they try to keep all these things at grade six reading level. And at one point I was working on a document, you know, working with these people. And one of the uh, criteria was that uh, the words should only be two syllables or less. And I said, mammogram is three syllables. How <laughs> no, and that's, you know, they often say a mammogram is an X-ray of the breast. Um, so it's, it, but, but to be fair, they do make an effort. And I think if you look at the uh, BC cancer website, you'll see that it's pretty lay language, but they certainly downplay the significance of dense breasts. And I don't think they even encourage women to have supplemental screening. Now, the good news, uh, this Ontario was the latest province to come on board. I'm not sure uh, where your listenership they're from is. They're all over the place, the US, North America, they're all over the world. Okay, well, so let me just throw in a couple of uh, tidbits. Ontario just came on board in the last couple of weeks that they are going to, they, they have started telling all women their breast density, but in their patient information, they imply that it's only category D that's at risk. So they're making, uh, and, and because there's so many more women in category C than in category D, the, the percentages are, have, are a little bit different now. Um, and I won't go into this, but you can think and, and, and 
uh, rough terms, that 10% of women are category A, 40 are category B, 40 are category C, and 10 are category D. In fact, it might be a little less than that. So, so if you think of who's going to get breast cancer and who's at risk of it being uh, uh, camouflaged, Category C, there's way more women who are going to get category just because there are so many more women in category C. And yet Ontario is making it sound like only women in category D need to be concerned. Why? But what but because because um they're going to offer screening breast ultrasound or other supplemental screening to women in category D. And of course, it would be very expensive to extend that from 10% to 50% of women. Okay, here, stop stop there a second. <laughs> stitch in time again isn't it cheaper to catch somebody and and find out they're okay or catch it right at the beginning than catching somebody when they're in the d and now they've got to go through you know the chemotherapy the radiation the breast augmentation all of that isn't that more expensive than the prevention i'm smiling because you're asking perfect questions <laughs> so women often say that but a mammogram costs what sixty dollars, and look at how how expensive all my treatment's going to be. Yes. But what it's not just that woman's cancer and that woman's treatment. It's in order to find the really sm relatively small number of cancers out there. Let's say it's uh, five per thousand. You've got to do a thousand mammograms. Mm -hmm. There's about a ten percent false alarm rate. So all of those ten percent need some needed a, just one extra mammogram picture some need extra mammogram pictures and then an ultrasound some women need an ultrasound uh and a needle biopsy so it's the cost of those thousand screening mammograms and the all the additional tests generated by the false alarms but this is what is changing uh if you look at 10 years ago we had a certain number of chemotherapy drugs and women the bad news was women didn't live that long. So it wasn't expected. Yeah, they got that those chemotherapy drugs and then they they died. So that was the good news is you saved money. But now the economics are changing because yeah. we've got all these amazing chemotherapy drugs. And women get not just one, but they they get put on a first line drug and they do okay for several years, and then their cancer comes back, and they get put on another even more expensive one, and so on and so on. So uh, colleagues in uh, Ottawa, again, fabulous uh, work showing that what it costs to, to treat the stage four cancers now compared to before, and the women are, the great news is the women are living so much longer. Yeah. It is becoming so expensive to treat those late stage cancers, that it's probably going to be pretty close to a wash to let's, okay, let's spend more money screening women in the forties yes, so that we can catch their cancers. Because those are the ones when a woman in her forties gets cancer and she's premenopausal and her ovaries are still making hormones, those cancers grow faster than in the postmenopausal women, postmenopausal women who aren't on hormones. So their estrogen levels are lower and their cancers aren't growing as fast you want to cast the fast growing ones. Yes. Um, I mean, after all, women in the 40s, they're nowadays they have toddlers at home. They're looking after aging parents and and working and contributing to the economy. So they're not expendable. Yeah. And so the well, economic no, nobody is expendable. And this is, you know, this has always been my pet peeve my entire life and really gets the hairs on my neck going up, is when you put life as less important than money. You know, that, I mean, I think this is what's wrong with society as a whole, any country that it's always about the money is more, the people are expendable because it's too expensive. They have so got it the wrong way around. And that if you invest in the people, in their well-beingness, uh, inside out, mental, physical, spiritual, and all ways, those people then become productive and generate more money. And, and and it doesn't matter if you're investing in their well key, but it, it just really gets to be a pet weave when we can spend useless money on electing another official or another president or prime minister or whatever. And yet you're saying we're going to cheap out on providing, you know, precaution for women or awareness for women. And it's OK if a few of them die. Well, um, yeah, of course, that's correct. But in a social medicine system mm -hmm. like we have in Canada, 
there's a finite number of dollars and breast cancer isn't the only disease that right. we have to be, you know, so people Put more need, money in the kitty then <laughs> how, 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 how much, how much taxation will the public tolerate? Mm -hmm. um, and we have prostate cancer to screen for and colorectal cancer and lung cancer and so on. Um, I think we need to put a lot more towards prevention because yes, uh, yes, yes. I will, yes. I will show uh, you. Got to ask me to. Got to let me share the slides. Because, yes, uh, yes, yes. I, I mean, look, prevention is all is that. You know, would you say twenty, thirty, forty years that cancer is more prevalent today than ever in the history of time, or is it that we're just more aware of the cancers now? Before you start sharing the slides. Yes, that's, uh, I think, I think it is becoming more prevalent because we are living longer and we're all going to die of something. Right. Uh, if we, if we prevent heart disease, then we're going to get cancer when we're older. Um, but also, for example, we know that uh, cancer is increasing in younger women, that incidence in younger women is increasing. Um, so uh, let me show my slides now yes. because I'll yes. address some of the questions we've already talked about and, um, and some not. Uh, some that are coming up. So let's hope my slides share properly. Okay. So you've seen this. Okay, so let's just click ahead here. So you asked about why start at 40. Here's the incidence of breast cancer. Well, you know, it's one in eight. Everybody's heard that number, but really uh, it, it changes over time and breast cancer gets more common as women get older. So it's really rare. And at, at age 20, um, it's one in 1,700 let's jump at 40, it's one in 69. So big jump between 30 yes. and 40. And then um, it keeps getting more common. And if women don't die of something else, they don't get hit by a car, die of heart attack, uh, their risk of breast cancer keeps going up. So all women ideally should start screening at 40. But I will add that it's especially important in um, the term they use now is racialized black Asian and Hispanic women who get breast cancer younger than white women. Oh, they for sure, Okay. Their peak incidence is in the mid forties for white women. It's in the late fifties, early sixties. So these racialized women absolutely need to start screening at age 40. If we're going to find their cancers early. Next slide. And of course, if cancer is in, if breast cancer is in your family, would you recommend even starting at 30? Um, what we do is we say, if your mom had breast cancer younger than 50, you should start screening 10 years before her diagnosis, but not younger than 30. Okay. And yes, all these guidelines we're talking about, I should have said from the task force, they're for average risk women. Mm -hmm. So that's not women with a first degree family history uh, and so on, not women who have the BRCA gene. Now we talked about um, uh, the incidence of breast cancer and can cancers be prevented? So here are two lists. The list on the left, these are risks that you can't control. If you inherited the breast cancer gene, if you needed chest wall radiation for Hodgkin's disease when you were a young person, all these things on this list uh, increase a woman's risk of getting cancer. Ashkenazi Dense breast tissue being one of them. <laughs> yes, it is. But but uh, women of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, that's, that's uh, white Jewish women whose families came from Eastern Europe. Um, family history, like I spoke about, women who started their periods younger, and women who well, went what do you mean younger? What age would you put that at? Well, younger than let's say age twelve. Okay. And lots of girls now are starting at age nine. They're better nourished, mm -hmm. and and menopause. Uh, me sorry, menarche. That's the age a woman starts having periods is dropping. Uh, women who went into menopause later. These are all risks you cannot control, but look at this list because this is the list that women can control to some extent to reduce their risk of getting breast cancer. Maybe for the people who are just listening, actually cover what they all are. So I am going to read that. Yes. Wonderful. Thank so, you. So, so combined hormone therapy after menopause. Now, uh, women often take uh, hormone therapy to reduce hot flashes and other menopause symptoms. And we know that women in the 80s and before that who took um, Premarin and Provera, that was the standard combined therapy. Um, and they took it for longer than five to seven years, were at a higher risk to get heart attacks, strokes, blood clots, and breast cancer. Um, it's different now. Uh, we don't use those drugs anymore, but still women should feel, you know, by all means use combined hormone therapy to improve your quality of life. 
but for the shortest possible period of time and certainly use modern drugs that are better than the ones I, I just named. We know that a dietary fat consumption mm. increases a woman's risk of getting breast cancer. Alcohol is a big one. Women hate hearing about this. Yes. <laughs> uh, but the new Canadian guidelines are to try to uh, stay to two drinks a week or less. Mm -hmm. And I have women say to me all the time, oh, I don't drink that much. I just have a glass of wine every night with dinner. Three drinks a week is known to be associated with is increased risk, not only of breast cancer, but other cancers. Can, so I, alcohol can I ask you about that though? Because like in, um, in the European thing, glass of wine with dinner is something that is just traditional. Do they have a higher cancer rate over there because of that? Or is it because it's, They've been doing it forever. Um, it might be because they have a healthier lifestyle and they walk right. everywhere. They're not yeah. overweight. Yes. And these, are, you know, this is sort of a combined picture here. Right. So lack of exercise. We know that moderate exercise uh, reduces breast cancer risk. So a sedentary lifestyle increases your risk. Everybody, if you're if you're used to sitting around watching TV after dinner, get out and go for a walk. Mm -hmm. um, uh, smoking. That's one of the more minor ones, but excess body weight after menopause is a big one because even though uh, a woman might be menopausal and not taking estrogen, uh, the adrenal glands produce a hormone that's converted to an estrogen-like compound in body fat. Mm -hmm. So women who are overweight um, have excess estrogen levels. You can there's something called the um, BMI mm -hmm. uh, and body the, mass you, indicator. Yes, and you can go online and just Google uh, BMI calculator mm -hmm. and you enter your height and weight and be honest, we're all a little shorter than we used to be. <laughs> um, yes. Come up with your BMI. And if you're at if you're in the obese uh, range um, or even overweight range, you know, you gotta increase your exercise and, and reduce your calorie intake. Um, so these are things you can control. Mm -hmm. Um this is a, this is a, one of the myths that that's out there. Women say, "Well, I don't have to worry about breast cancer because there's no breast cancer in my family." Mm -hmm. In fact, eighty five percent of women who get breast cancer have no family history, yeah. Yeah. and even doctors don't know that. That's why all women need to get screened. Mm -hmm. um, so, less than fifteen percent have a family member with breast cancer, and the incidence of the uh, breast cancer gene is even lower than that. So everybody needs to be screened. Here's um, a website I like called Know Your Lemons. Mm -hmm. So a lot of women think um, that, you know, if they're going to find a breast cancer in themselves, it's going to be a lump. Well, there are actually loads of ways that breast cancer can show up. And um, it can be that there's an indentation in the skin. It can be that the skin's kind of swollen and firm and looks a little bit like the skin of an orange with, with little dimpling in it. Um, the, the nipple can be retracted, uh, but they have, they have a website and they have an app and they just use lemons in the egg carton to kind of show you what that might look like. So women need to know it's not always a lump. Um, I remember seeing a patient who had a big, hard, you know, cancer, it was occupying about half of her breast and she'd been ignoring it. And I said, why didn't you come in sooner? And she said, well, I didn't think it was cancer. It didn't feel like a pee. Right. Mm. So, mm. so any change and women can only know if there's been a change, if they know what their normal texture is, right. maybe their normal texture is the bag of marbles. That's okay. Get to know it. You don't have to obsessively do breast exam once a month. But if you're premenopausal, try to always do it when you're just finishing your period because lumpiness changes through the menstrual cycle. Most women's breasts are more lumpy and tender before their period and then better after. So always check after the period and that way you're comparing apples with apples. Mm -hmm. So again, knowyourlemons.org and, um, and have a look. You can load the app if you want. So, um, and we've talked about this. Why do we screen? We screen because we want to find cancer as early as possible, not only to save lives, but so that women can be treated with less aggressive therapy and have a better quality of life. Here's another, another factoid for you. Um, what, when, so we don't typically talk about survival, the length of survival, because um, of something called lead time bias. And that's why our task force is so obsessed with using randomized control trials, but there are, there are better ways of looking at it. But the fact is that if you're diagnosed at stage one 
or zero, the five-year survival rate is almost 100%. Yeah. And the good news is that about 65% of women are diagnosed at that stage. Mm -hmm. But if you're diagnosed at stage four, the five-year survival is only 23%. Mm. About 6% of women are diagnosed at that stage. So five-year five survival is an easier concept to grasp than mortality reduction. Mm. But So this is why I'm showing you this slide. Now, um, I don't know what your listenership is like, but uh, if you have women who've never had a mammogram, I've threw this slide in just so they know what to expect. Mm -hmm. And I see, I see you nodding. Yes. <laughs> the standard mammogram is two pictures of each breast, one with the breast compressed from top to bottom, and the other when it's compressed, not perfectly side to side at 90 degrees, but at this angle. And the reason we use this angle is because all of us embryologically have breast tissue extending up towards the armpit. Mm -hmm. And this picture includes more of that breast tissue. And I've told you there are two reasons why we have to compress to um, spread the tissue out so we can see the cancers more easily, the ones that are there, and also to use less radiation. Uh, just to address one myth that's out there, uh, women who have breast implants can and should have mammograms. The technologists take um, the, the usual pictures and then they take a couple of uh, special pictures to get the implant out of the way and compress only the patient's native breast tissue, which helps us see the cancers. Those yeah. are done very carefully and the techs know what they're doing. So, of course, people who have their breast implants are always worried about it bursting, right? Yeah, no. Mm -hmm. No, uh, virtually, uh, especially uh, the the newer implants are much more sturdy. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, if a woman's in a car accident and she has a yeah. you know st steering wheel injury, um, bashing into the steering wheel, yes, implants can rupture, but um, not 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 from a mammogram. So this is the picture showing the different kinds of breast tissue, the different categories, A, B, C, or D. And you can see that category A is completely dark gray with just a few white lines. Those white lines are blood vessels and what we call Cooper's ligaments. Category B, we say is the patient has scattered densities, <clears throat> a little bit of normal breast tissue. Category C, a lot more white stuff that is normal breast tissue. And here you see category D where there's hardly any fat and the mm. breast is all white. And the next slide I'm gonna show you shows why um, it's cancers can be camouflaged. It's gonna, I think it's gonna start playing automatically. <laughs> there you go. So you see that cancer, you can see it easily in the dense, in the fatty breast. Mm -hmm. You saw it in the, I'm just gonna see if I, I don't think I can, let's see if I can. And you see how yes. hard it is to see. Now yeah. what I want to show you, if I can go back, no, sorry. <laughs> yeah, ahead. for those that are listening, you've got to look at this slide, which will be on the PDF. Okay. But yeah, you've got to see it for yourself to understand. And you and they won't see the video on the PDF, of course. Right. So I'm going to start it and stop it. So here, no matter where the cancer is in her breast, it's going to show up. Right. The category A. In category B, we could see the cancer. Well, why did it do that? <laughs> In, in category B, I'm just going to point on the slide. Right. You can see the cancer when it was this part of her breast, and she has hardly any dense tissue. But if the cancer happens to occur there, even in a category B breast, we could miss it, but it's not likely. Then, of course, in category C and D, when there's so much more normal white, um, it's much easier to miss a cancer. Yes. And in the previous slide I showed you, um, this lady has lots of normal, she's a category D, but you can still see she's got plenty of fat. And if her cancer ended up starting there, we'd see it. But if you look at the previous slide, this lady, uh, no matter where she gets a cancer, we're not going to see it because her breast is so dense. Right. So that's the, that's the visual of what dense breast tissue is. And finally, I just wanted to show you this slide, and this is from uh, uh, the um, Canadian Cancer Society 2001 statistics showing the breast cancer incidence in Canada by decade. And you can see that um, already in the 40s, we're up to 3,400 cases in Canada. The highest incidence is in women in the 60s, and then it drops. Now, it doesn't drop because 
um, because they don't have to worry about getting cancer. It's because that's when women start dying of other things. Mm -hmm. So the number of cases drops, but the individual risk to women keeps going up. So when a woman's in her 70s and she's healthy, her risk of breast cancer uh, is higher than it was in the 60s and when she's in her 80s and so on. What you need to know is we recommend that women continue having uh, mammograms and um, uh, have breast cancer screening as long as their life expectancies is about 10 years. And Statistics Canada shows us that for a 75-year-old woman, that's when some uh, screening programs stop screening women. A 75-year-old woman, a life expectancy is 13 years. We're talking about a healthy woman who yeah. doesn't already have a metastatic lung cancer, a pancreatic cancer. Uh, for a healthy 80-year-old woman, it's 10 years. So if a woman's 80 and she's healthy, she should keep having screening. I have a friend who's 84. She bought a, um, a, a bicycle last year and she rides 10K three times a week. Wow. She's still getting mammograms. Of course she is. She's healthy and she's living a healthy lifestyle. Now, this is the, something that's confusing to so people, so many people. You're living a healthy lifestyle. You may not have the fat. You're being um, exercising. You're eating well. You're looking at the sunny side of the street with the attitude, yet you could still get cancer of the breast. Is there anything that we can do to reduce that possibility of getting cancer, or is it inevitable? So for women at average risk, okay, not the women – with the BRCA gene. No, it is a crapshoot. Do everything right and cross your fingers. Mm. Nothing you did wrong. Right. So women, do the best you can so that you won't feel guilty. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you get breast cancer and you've been a big drinker your whole life, you might feel alone. Maybe I shouldn't have had that much alcohol. Maybe I should have exercised more. Maybe I should have, whatever, eaten more vegetables. But even if you do everything right, you can still get cancer. The women with the breast cancer gene. So uh, we just talked about the average lifetime risk is one in eight. Um, the women with the breast cancer gene, some of them, their risk of getting breast cancer is um, 80%. Not yeah. So one in eight is 12%, right? So, um, right. so it's so, in that case, it's just a question of when. Almost. And those women some of whom you know about Angelina Jolie, yes. to have prophylactic mastectomies. Now, they won't do a prophylactic mastectomy in a woman who's at average risk because we say just keep getting screened. On the other hand, we're not optimally screening women. We're not screening them every year. We're not optimally doing uh, supplemental screening for women with dense breasts. Um, so, so I have a problem with that. But no, those women are not going to have a mastectomy. And also for women with the breast cancer gene who don't want the, the mastectomy surgeries, there are drugs that reduce risk, mm. but they all have significant side effects and they're not prescribed uh, for average risk women. Well, how much would you say, and I know I'm going way out of the medical here, but I think it's kind of proven in many cases of that remember what I call the sunny side of the street approach to life, the ad, good attitude, you know, really um, not feeding the fear, not feeding the doubt, not feeding past pains, but really kind of living, you know, kind of I call it that higher frequency of life and really immersing into it. Because, um, you know, I in the research that I've done is that a lot of the cancers could be genetic, but a lot of them also could be very much due to emotional diseases yeah, uh, but due to you know people becoming so stressed that they create the disease. What do you say to that, or is it too far out of your field? <laughs> it's, it it is out of my field, but there's no data to support mm. that. In fact, um, it's great when women can stay positive, like you're describing. But the fact is, we all have stress. Mm -hmm. We all have stress. Uh, even those of us who are super healthy. So um, no, and and um, I especially don't like it because it almost um, ass uh, assigns blame to women for, you know, you got cancer because you didn't have a positive attitude. Yeah. And that's, yeah, I, I don't like that. I I also don't like the the battle analogies, you know, women lost their battle with cancer. Um, mm -hmm. 
because it makes it sound like they should have fought harder. Or- right. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, but I think a positive attitude definitely does help in how you approach it. You know, there are an awful lot of people that when they get a diagnosis of cancer are dead very quickly because, uh, you know, they're, it's a death sentence where, where today, you know, it's I have this, then now this is what can I do about it? How can I fight this disease and win? So it means actually it's inviting you to be proactive in your own healing by doing whatever it is that you need to do. So I think that that positive attitude is don't look at it as a death sentence. Look at it as, okay, this is some, a challenge I have to face in life. And what do I need to know in that challenge? That's that's a good attitude, but I wouldn't say that not having that attitude is going to make them die faster. Um, you know, as long as women do as much as they can, they let's say they have the positive attitude and then they get cancer, or at least they had the most enjoyment out of life uh, until the cancer came. And yes, they're going to face it as a challenge and they'll do the best they can and the, they'll get the best treatment that they can. Um, and no, at least they did everything, you know, everything they could at the end. Now, I know that this has been something that's been brought up and elsewhere before, but I'm going to ask you this. I, I, I well, was the one in the talk that you did when I talked about wire bras, uh, because some people have said the wire bras can cause cancer and you're saying definitely not. But also if somebody has an impact on their breasts, you know, an accident or something that hurts them. Can that put them at higher risk or is this something they need to be aware of? Nope. Nope. Good to know. Uh I hate the wire bras. (laughs) Don't wear No, I mean, don't wear There's so many bras now that don't have underwires. Yes, Uh, there's still not some for the double Ds, though. (laughs) So it's still hard to find those that can lift them up. But, yeah, it's the – and, you know, bras can be very, very uncomfortable. So I would imagine that – you're doing your breasts a favor to find that bra where it is, does feel extremely comfortable because uh, you may not be causing cancer, but what you are doing is not serving your breasts in any way because, you know, by wearing the wrong bra. Whether you wear a bra or not doesn't influence your breast cancer risk. Uh, and whether your bra is comfortable or not doesn't affect breast cancer, just affects your comfort. Right. So do what works for you. The other the other myth that's out there is deodorant. Deodorant doesn't cause breast cancer. Right. Especially now. Um, you know, um, women who are breastfeeding, and um, I did hear way back that if you breastfed, it's a better prevention. Is that an old wise tale? Nope, that's true. Um, in fact, uh, well, the, the, the magic number is if you breastfeed for a year, and that's not each child, that's all together. Right. That would be a risk reduction, but it's, it's, um, it's not something that most women, you know, most women, by the time they start looking at breast cancer risks, uh, they're way past their breastfeeding years. So it's water under the bridge. It's, you know, having more children and starting younger also reduce risk, but nobody's going to have more children just to Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Definitely not. And of course, um, it's getting much more common to have children later in life. Yes. Uh, you know, there was a time when when women started their families in their late teens. Yes. And now we have women at in their 40s having their first child. Yes, exactly. My daughter had hers at 32, 34. I finished at 34. I have a friend who had hers at 37, 39 and 42 and some people having even older. So yes, the the family dynamics have changed quite considerably. Now for more information, what are the best sites for people to go to? Well, I'm going to send you the slide set and I will put one of the slides I will add to it that I didn't show just now, um, give some more resources. Um, uh, I would recommend women look at Dense Breasts Canada, that's breasts with an S, Canada.ca, and um, mybreastscreening.ca. Now, we've been focusing on Canada. I will just throw in uh, that it's much different in other countries. The UK only screens every three years, um, which is really not doing that much good. No. Um, um, the US... It's the practice is to screen every year starting at 40 and the FDA has mandated that all women in the U S be told their breast density and uh, some information, the real information about breast density, not downplaying it like BC has done. Uh, So within Canada, it varies by province. And if you want to know what's available in your province, 
uh, the companion website to Dense Breast Canada is mybreastscreening.ca. You click on your province, it'll tell you exactly what, what's available in your province. And those, those uh, websites are kept up to date. Um, women who've, if there are any women listening who've had cancer, please consider sharing your story. There's yes. the story site um, a page of Dense Breast Canada. Um, and please offer to help advocate women, you know, you were the call to action you, you started out with Mm -hmm. women need to write, and that can be done by email. They're member of parliament. Uh, they're, uh, in, in, in Ottawa, the health minister, tell them that they need to, uh, restructure the task force so that it not only consults experts, but that the experts are kind of driving the train. Yes. Um, so their MP and the health minister, and we have a new health minister, um, they should uh, write uh, the same letter, just write it to all three pl- oh, all the-, all the place. The uh, PHAC, um, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and um, their MLA or MPP in their province to make sure their province is doing everything that can be done. Yes. And, you know, folks, I often talk about this, having, you you have a book club, have a podcast club. Everybody listens to the podcast. And after that, you share your perspectives. You share what you got from it, because now you're broadening the, um, the, the knowledge, but you're also broadening the experience. This is something I want you to talk about. Don't be afraid to talk about it in men's company, because they need to be an advocate for women they love as well. And so we need to make sure that we are letting people know. Do you know? Have you heard? Listen to this podcast. Reach your MLA talk to the the health people, demand that we have the experts in place, demand that they listen to women. This is our lives that they're talking about. They shouldn't have choice over our lives and how we live it or, you know, when we should die or whether we are a statistic that's easily got rid of. No, we all have that right to that, uh, that testing. And yes, okay, it may be expensive to test for all the cancers, but when you're not testing and you start treating you are quadrupling the expense. So the old stitch in time, catching things right at the beginning when you can do something about it is so much more empowering across the board, including the the monetary board, the money board, and it just makes more sense. I'd like to see more common sense come into play and less politics and more listening from the doctors, from the patients, and more paying attention to what the latest information is, latest technologies are, and what we can do to empower ourselves, but also, you know, power each other. But also we're going to make their lives easier by giving them, I need to know, A, B, C, and D. I want you to have this up there that's accessible for me, that this information can be passed on. I don't want any cloak and data. And I don't want your personal opinion. I want your professional opinion uh, based on that you are up to date with the current information. The only way we're going to see that change is we are the change that generates the change. So please make sure you share this far and wide. Make sure that you are talking to everybody that you need to talk to. Whether you have cancer, have had cancer, or do not want cancer, be the advocates for the change, because that's the only way we're going to make a difference. We are the difference that we seek. Thank you so much for coming on today and sharing this very valuable information. My pleasure. To everyone out there, remember, your health is your choice. And sometimes somebody else is making that choice for you, but you can change that, okay? When we empower ourselves through knowledge, we empower ourselves to do something about it. So until next time. Bye for now. We hope that you enjoyed the show. There are so many more for you here on selfdiscoverywisdom.com. Just go to the podcast tag at the top there and you will see all the many genres and all 3,000 shows ready for your listening. We are here to serve you, to help you on your journey of life. And we know that through inspiration, it begets invitation. We are supported by you, the listeners, and those that we interview. Anything that you can spare us in donation would be greatly accepted and we do hope that you enjoy the next show.